Today's reading includes three passages from the gospel according to Matthew. Matthew 13, 31 to 33. He put out another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Matthew 13, 44 to 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Matthew 6, 9 to 13. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. We're spending some time looking at the Lord's Prayer because uh, as Christ taught us to pray this prayer in Matthew chapter 6, he prefaces it by saying he wants to make sure it's not a meaningless prayer that we just repeat over time, but at the same time, he also wants it to be a prayer that we repeat all the time. So we're taking a little moment to, to look more closely at it. And so we're looking at the next petition, uh, petition which is uh, asking God for his kingdom to come. Uh, and, and as we think about uh, uh, what it means to, to, for God's kingdom to come, uh, you know, we're, we're, we have lots of thoughts about what that looks like. Right now, uh, many of the world's eyes are focused on Ukraine, about Russia uh, is potentially uh, extending its kingdom a little bit, enforcing its influence, being able to force its influence on another nation. And I use that word influence because if you think about it, part of the, the reason when when a kingdom is extending itself um, is that it wants its influence to grow greater and wider. When ancient Rome used to conquer a nation, the way it would exert its influence over the nation it's conquered, would first thing it would do is take all the best lands for itself and give it to Roman nobility and Roman soldiers, uh, the best land of the conquered era. Then they would force the people there to learn Latin, and then they would build roads and walls and things to that city. Again, they're influencing and trying to transform uh, that, that nation into a colony of Rome. That's forced influence, but there's also another kind of influence that you might not realize is forced, but it does cause a change. There's other influence where we just allow people to influence us. Uh, over the last couple years during the pandemic, the, uh, the uh, Kate, Princess Kate, who's uh, married to the future King of England, uh, apparently there were seven or eight different times during the pandemic she just wore an outfit outside. And because everyone uh, wants to be like her, or a lot of people do, and there was not less, not less going on during the pandemic, seven or eight times uh, she wore an outfit outside, and apparently within minutes, people were able to discern where she bought the outfit from, and the store around the world sold out of that outfit. Uh, we call people on social media and other ways influencers um, because their, their goal is to influence you. And so what we're going to talk and look at today is how um, when we talk about, when we pray that, Lord, your kingdom would come, what we're asking um, is for God to be the greatest influence in our life. And at the same time, we're asking for other influencers, other influences to go away. So this is a great time for you to have a heart check and say, what are the influences on your life? Because that's what that prayer is focusing on. That those things that are influencing you would be conquered. That is a bold prayer. So when you pray, Lord, let your kingdom come, be prepared. You're asking for life as you know it to change. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. And we now we ask, uh, firstly, for all the children in our church, Lord, we thank you for each one of them. Lord, there are some on the way. 
Lord, we thank you for uh, how you are blessing us. We pray that all the children of our church would never know a moment without you as their Savior. We pray, Lord, that they would hold fast to that truth that you love them. We pray for their parents, that you would encourage them. We pray for all those that work with kids, Lord, that you would give them grace and wisdom and mercy. Let the gospel flow in how they teach. We pray for any adult children that have wandered away, Lord, that you would draw them back. Holy Spirit, we ask now, this time, that through your word we would die to sin and become more alive to you. Father, we thank you for this time, and it's in your son's Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just to, make, just to quickly get us to the point when we're talking about kingdom and the Bible, uh, even when Jesus was born, the, the idea of God establishing his kingdom has been around for a long time. It had been around for thousands of years already, and so people were always hoping for God's kingdom to be ushered in. One of the biggest problems when Jesus uh, was born and as he became a man and started his ministry is that people were confused when he talked about a kingdom because most people's views was, was for a physical kingdom, which is what they were used to seeing. And we see that uh, in the Bible, Jesus talks about kingdom in different ways. There's a spiritual one. There's a physical one. The physical one's coming later. The spiritual one's now. What we call that is the already and not yet. Uh, we call this the inaugurated, sorry, this is a theological term, but it's good to know, inaugurated eschatology, end time. What it means is that Jesus has come, he has risen, he has conquered, he is the king, yet, so right now, in faith, spiritually, he is the king, and he's still the king of the universe, but we're still waiting for a time when he comes back and then affirmatively establishes his physical kingdom as well. So it's already and not yet. And the idea of inaugurated means it's happened, but we're still waiting for it to happen. I think a great example that Jesus uses a lot is a wedding. If you've ever been to a wedding that uses, uh, that, that the whole wedding pr procession, the whole wedding thing starts kind of early. When, when, are the, when does the wedding actually happen? Is it actually at the vows? Would you say, nope, that's not the wedding? No, you say the wedding started whenever the wedding started. In different families, different couples, the wedding starts differently. I've been at weddings where the wedding absolutely started three days before the ceremony. If you weren't there at the event three days before the ceremony, you're basically counted as missing the wedding. And so in the ancient world too, the, the wedding ceremony started many days before the wedding. And so think of a wedding. So this whole process, the wedding has started, but it hasn't officially finished yet. Got it? And so when we talk about God's kingdom, it started. It's just not officially done yet. It's still coming. Theologians Voss and Ladd, if you want to look them up, uh, really kind of wrote uh, a lot down to help us understand this. But we're, we're living in the time, so we talk about the kingdom, we understand that it's here, but it's not yet fully here. All right, do we all understand that? It's here, not yet fully here. The wedding ceremony, the wedding started, but it's not done yet. Things are still happening around us. The second thing we need to understand is when we talk about the kingdom, what we mean by that is the kingdom is the place where Jesus is the ruler. Got it? Two things. So it means it's already, not yet. It also means when we're talking about the kingdom, we're talking about God's kingdom, we're talking about Jesus is the one who's ruling. Two passages to point that out. Philippians 2.9. This talks about what, we, what God does with Jesus. Therefore God has exalted him and bestowed him on the name that is above every name. That every knee in heaven and earth shall bow to. Jesus is above everyone, above every thing. In Luke 1, 32 to 33, at Jesus' birth, right? It talks about how Jesus is going to fulfill the prophecy. And it says that he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. So that means we're talking about Jesus as the ruler. What we mean is his rule is absolute, complete sovereign. That's the Philippians verse. And that'll go on for all eternity. That's the verse here in Luke. Got it? So when we talk about the kingdom, this inaugurated eschatology means it's here, not yet. It's coming, it's here. Not fully here, more is, more is unfolding. But it also means he's completely sovereign for all time over everything, right? So he's sovereign for eternity and over everything. Got it? Everyone there with me? That's what it means when we talk about him being the ruler, when he is the king, all right? So when we're talking about the kingdom, that's what we're talking about. That's who Christ is. So now let's look at Matthew 6.10 a little more. Your kingdom come. Now all of this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven is one full petition. But we're going to focus just on what we're saying when we say your kingdom come. Now when I talked about influence. The word we really want to start using is rule. It is a, it is a word maybe we don't like in a Western context. 
but it means rule. We're going to talk about your kingdom come means God is going to rule. God, we want you to rule. And no one likes authority that much, right? No one likes to be told what to do. On almost any way, any time, any place, people want to, people want to, be, they, they want to say, I want to feel like I, I want some say in the decisions that are being made. I was at a grocery store just the other day and another lane opened up and someone was like, well, why is that lane opening up? They wanted to know why the lane right here wasn't opening. Why would you open up lane 10 when we're standing in front of lane 2? We are, by human nature, we don't like anything ruling over us. So this is where we get the first. So the first rule, this petition, there's three things we're looking at. We're going to look at three parables very quickly. It says this. The first one, again, is about to rule means to extend. And we're talking about extend what? When God's, when we're playing this petition, your kingdom come, what we're praying is, God, we want you to extend something. Let's look at the parable, Matthew 13, 31 to 32. He put another parable for them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants. It becomes a tree so that birds of the air can come make nests in its branches. What we're talking about, extending, is extending God's borders extending his peace, his shalom. This is what we're praying. When we are praying, your kingdom come, be aware what you're saying is, I want, remember we talked about this is a bold prayer? What you're saying is, I want everyone, everywhere, to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You're saying, I'm not happy if there's anyone, anywhere, that doesn't know Jesus Christ. That is a very bold thing to pray, in 2022, let alone say, right? And that's what we're praying. And the, the imagery that God uses in the Old Testament, especially in Isaiah, is that of a tent. And what he says in Isaiah is that I want the, 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 the borders of my tent to get bigger and bigger. If you think about it back when Isaiah was written, people still lived in tents. God's tabernacle, um, the first, his first temple was a tent. And the idea is that God says we want the, the, the end of our tent to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what we're praying. But what we understand is that what's spread out, what is being spread out, what, how are we tracing this border is not a wall, not an actual tent, but God's peace. This is the difference. We're not conquering with any type of sword or shield. It's God's peace. That's going. So remember, peace means that you have complete peace on the inside and peace on the outside around you. It's a peace that only comes from knowing Jesus Christ. It's a peace that will settle you in the worst of times and last for all eternity. And so when we say that his rule will extend, we're saying we want his peace to extend. When we pray, God, your kingdom come, we're saying we want your peace that only comes from knowing you to extend everywhere, to know no boundaries, to know no bounds. That's what you're praying. We want your peace to spread. And remember, we've mentioned this many times, what is our tool? What are our weapons for extending this border? Holiness. That's all it gives us. <laughs> Holiness. You might want other weapons or tools, but that's not what God wants. He wants you to extend this peace through holiness and knowing him. Where we often fail at this is thinking God's peace isn't that necessary. Either we're thinking we don't need God's peace that much, or we fail this thinking other people don't need to God's, know God's peace. They, they are pretty okay people. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're a very civilized group. They're very... They're very nice. They're very clean. They're, they're, they're very educated. They're very happy. Where we fail at this is thinking that people don't need God's peace. And why? Because we judge with our eyes and not with our faith. Our faith tells us everyone needs to know God's peace. Colossians 3.15, when Paul was writing this, reminding the church what they are to do, how they are to work with one another, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. 
your kingdom come. You are praying that God's peace would extend. We don't just mean peace, no wars. We're talking about a peace that comes from knowing Jesus Christ personally. Are you bold enough to pray that? Does that make you nervous? Next petition. Again, same petition, actually. 610. Your kingdom come. Verses, again, to extend the peace. This next one is to rule. We want to see something transformed. What kind of rules? Again, the first idea is that this ruling is going to, if God want God to rule, we want his peace to extend. If we want God to rule, something needs to be transformed. Let's look at the next parable. Matthew 13, 13. Uh, sorry, 1333. He told him another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like this leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. This is the, the word we like to use a lot. This is the word for discipleship. We want our hearts to be transformed. We're playing your kingdom come. We're saying we want the kingdom extended through peace and we want our hearts transformed by knowing him. We want the kingdom to come means you're saying, God, transform my heart. I love that picture of dough. Now, actually, interesting enough, um, uh, the same analogy for sin is used. That when sin is worked in, it spreads everywhere. And that's the problem of sin. It doesn't matter if there's just a little sin. It's spread to every part of our body. Sin is everywhere. But now the example here is being used that kingdom of God is like you sprinkle it again, it's spread everywhere. I like this picture of what it looks like when someone's working with dough. You might think discipleship is a gentle, this is someone squishing it and pounding it, and there's a roller there to get the sucker rolled around. (laughs) That's what discipleship is like. When you're praying, your kingdom come, you're saying, God, do that. What that baker's doing to that dough, you're saying, God, do that to my heart. I need you to work your kingdom into my heart. Again, look at that picture and be like, that doesn't, if I was that dough, that wouldn't feel very good. No, but that's what we need. That's what you're praying. And you're praying that not because you have to, right? But because you need to. You're saying, God, I need you to do that to my heart. I need you to work it over. This is what we're asking God to do. This is what, from the previous petition from last week, this is what making God's name hallowed looks like. When you make God's name holy, that's what you're doing. You're setting your heart apart for the Lord. And again, what we're saying is we want the transformation to happen from inside out. That's what discipleship is. That's what that praying your kingdom come means. You want God's peace to spread out, and you want his kingdom growing inside of your heart. That's going to transform how you view everything. Because the problem of sin is it, takes, it makes us look at something that's not good and say it's good or not so bad. And it makes us look at the good things and say that's not good or not right. Remember, this is where we talk about where you're wrestling with God. Praying this prayer is you saying, God, we're going to come to things where I, to my core, disagree with what your word says. But I need you to work my heart over This is what that petition is asking. And how we fail at this is by letting other things rule our heart, by letting other influencers, influences, tell us what is good and what is right and what is true, other than God's word. We all do this, just so you're aware. Every one of us does this. And this is why we fail at it. We need to trust God and his word above our own. He needs to be the greatest influence in our life. Again, so how do, we, how do we get there? Is that we need to let go of and move away from those other influences, realize what they are, and move away from them. John 3.3 3 says this. Jesus answers, this is a guy asking, what does he need to, be, need to do to be saved? And Jesus says, truly I say to you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus is always talking about the kingdom. And this guy says, what am I supposed to do? And Jesus says, you have to be born again. Again, what is born again doing? 
One illustration that was uh, profound in my own life, one illustration of what it means to be born again is that there's like a throne, metaphorical throne in your heart that you want reside, to be residing on. And becoming born again is about you stepping off of that throne and giving it to Christ. You're saying to him, I want you to rule me and not me. That's what we're praying when we say, your kingdom come. So let's look at, at again, the last one. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We looked at how praying that prayer is, you're saying you're extending God's peace. You're asking him to transform your, how, and now your heart, and now we're talking about surrendering. Surrendering what to what? Look at the last parable. Again, so in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gives a whole bunch of parables about the kingdom. I couldn't go through all of them. Some of them are similar, so I just picked a few to highlight that this is what Jesus wants. This is Jesus talking about the kingdom. So Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. What are these parables talking about? That it's worth surrendering everything you have to him. Are you willing to surrender, praying that his kingdom come? What you're praying is, what I prized most, I have to give up. I have to admit defeat. I have to admit, I have to give up trying. That's what you're praying. That his kingdom come, you're asking that what he values, you are now going to value. Praying that his kingdom come is you very much saying, I surrender. I'm going to give up trying to decide what is most valuable and precious according to my own definition. And I'm now going to allow God to define for me what is most valuable and precious. It is indeed you surrendering your kingdom and giving it over to him. That is not something any of us enjoy doing, but it's something you must do. We must do this. We must learn to prize and value what he prizes and values. By not doing that, you're still trying to hold on. When you're praying your kingdom come, you are indeed saying, Lord, I'm willing to give up my kingdom to be a part of yours. And our kingdom <laughs> looks like us. That's what our kingdom is. Our, our kingdom desires what we desire. You, I'm talking about us individuals. Our kingdom looks like our own moral standards. And saying you want God's kingdom to come, what you're saying is, I need to give all that up. My kingdom was built on a lie. My kingdom is built on sin. I want your kingdom to come and conquer. We don't like people to rule over us. We especially don't like to admit defeat. Yet that's what we're praying when we say, your kingdom come. I'm surrendering to you. Are you willing to give up the riches of this world for the riches of the next one? That's what he's asking us to do, to let go of what this world prizes most and start prizing most what he does. Our desires, our hopes, our dreams we got to be honest, we put way too much emphasis on things that won't matter in eternity. And asking his kingdom to come, what you're willing to do, what you're saying is, i got to give all that up. i got to stop putting value in those things and putting value in things that matter and things that are eternal. i got to replace those hopes and dreams with his hopes and dreams. 
And again, and why do we fail at this? We fail at this all often because we love to put our treasures in this life. We love to put our hopes and our dreams in this life and the things that this world says you should be hoping and dreaming for. So when we pray that prayer, your kingdom come, that's what we're asking. Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Jesus says this, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So where you, what you treasure most is where your heart is. If what you treasure most looks like things of this world, then that's where your heart is. If your heart's supposed to be set aside, making God hollow and desiring heaven, his kingdom, then that's where your treasure should be. When you say our kingdom come, you're asking God to rule in your heart. You're saying, God, may your peace extend everywhere. God, transform my heart. God, I surrender to you. Are you bold enough to pray your kingdom come? What or who rules your heart? What or who are the great influencers of your heart? Do you really want the kingdom to come? This is the prayer that Christ himself wants you to pray. He wants you to know in your heart of hearts that what we all need most is for his kingdom to come. Do you believe that? Can you pray that? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, without you coming, we were dead, dead in sin. But because you came, you beat death on a cross. And by your blood, we are now saved. Lord, we want your kingdom to come so that others would be saved by your work on the cross and that others would know the peace that only comes from knowing you. So Lord, help us to humbly pray, may your kingdom come. And let us joyfully look for the time when your kingdom fully come. Lord Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for our final song.